Research has shown that addiction, whether to alcohol, tobacco, or other drugs, is a disease caused in part by our genes. And like other diseases with a genetic influence, such as cancer and heart disease, addiction runs in families. We also know that despite its negative consequences, drug abusers continue to seek out drugs because of severe cravings for these substances, whether to make them feel good or to stop them from feeling bad. Because the drug experience can be so reinforcing, it's become the basis for what scientists have termed the reinforcement model of addiction. But as we all know, feeling better is just one of the effects of drugs. There are many other less desirable effects as well. So how do drugs make us lose control? Why do they make us feel compelled to use them again and again in spite of their often tragic effects? Well, the answers to these questions lie deep within the human brain. But before learning how drugs affect the brain, let's first review how our brain functions under normal conditions. At first glance, hitting a baseball doesn't look all that hard. Sure, just watch the ball and swing. But the truth is that being able to hit a baseball is a difficult task that requires a complex set of skills. Balance, coordination, concentration, timing, and judgment. All of these skills are possible thanks to the human brain's ability to make millions of split-second decisions, guiding everything we do with incredible precision. Our brains are made up of many millions of branching cells called neurons. These neurons form an incredibly complex communication network using a combination of electrical signals and chemical messages to direct all of our physical and mental activities. Although the neurons come very close to one another, they never actually touch. These close areas between neurons are called synapses, and the gap between two neurons is called a synaptic cleft. The neurons communicate with one another by sending chemical messengers across the synaptic cleft. These chemical messengers are called neurotransmitters. Many neurons communicate with hundreds, sometimes thousands of other neurons using synapses to form the brain's equivalent of an information superhighway. In addition to synapses, neurons have three other important components. One of these, the cell body, is the center of the neuron. Its branching arms connect the neuron with its synapses. A second important part, the dendrites, receive the incoming messages sent by other neurons. The dendrites are the arms that relay the messages to the cell body. Third, the arms that relay outgoing messages from the cell body to the synapses are called axons. When a neuron receives a message from a neighboring neuron, it sends a small electrical signal from the synapse down the dendrite to the cell body. When the cell body receives the appropriate signals from its neighboring neurons, it fires, sending a small electrical current down its axon to a synapse. This triggers the release of neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters carry a chemical message across the synaptic cleft to a neighboring neuron. The likelihood that a neuron will fire depends upon the balance of positively and negatively charged particles they contain. These electrically charged particles are called ions. Neurons containing more positive ions are more likely to fire. Neurons containing more negative ions are less likely to fire. Because different neurotransmitters send different messages, some neurotransmitters increase while others decrease the firing rates of neighboring neurons. Neurotransmitters that increase or speed up firing rates are called excitatory neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters that decrease or slow down the firing rates of neighboring neurons are called inhibitory neurotransmitters. By using a complex system of neurons, neurotransmitters, and ions, the brain is able to control everything we do. For the brain to function properly, neurons must correctly send chemical messages to one another in the form of neurotransmitters. This can only happen if the neurons contain the appropriate balance of positive and negative ions.
So now that we've seen how our brain functions under normal conditions, let's take a look at the impact of different drugs and how they act on the brain to create a fantasy world of false messages and faulty communications. For a drug to act on the brain, it first has to get to the brain. Somehow, the drug needs to get into our system where it can be absorbed into the bloodstream and delivered to its target. There are several ways in which drugs can be taken. The most common are swallowing, smoking, and injecting. By swallowing drugs, usually in the form of a pill, we get the drug into the stomach and intestine, where it is then absorbed into the bloodstream. For the drug abuser who is interested in a fast result, however, waiting for a drug to get absorbed from the stomach can be frustrating, since it usually takes about 10 to 15 minutes for drugs in the stomach to get absorbed and delivered to the brain. A faster way to get a drug into the bloodstream and on its way to the brain is to smoke it. This gets the drug into the lungs, where it is rapidly absorbed into many thousands of tiny blood vessels. These vessels are designed to rapidly absorb oxygen from the lungs and so are a very efficient way to get a drug into the blood. And from there, it is just a matter of seconds until the drug reaches the brain. But for the non-stop trip directly to the brain, flying IV airways is the way to go. Injecting a drug directly into a blood vessel ensures that it will reach the brain within just a few seconds, producing an extremely fast and powerful effect. Once a drug reaches the brain, it interacts with specific sites on neurons. These interactions are possible because drugs of abuse are masters at the art of deception. They have the ability to imitate the brain's naturally occurring neurotransmitters. In doing so, they trick neurons into believing that correct neurotransmitter messages are being sent, when in fact this is not the case. This causes malfunctions in the brain's normal communication processes. Different groups of drugs mimic different neurotransmitters. For example, cocaine, amphetamine, and other related stimulants mimic the neurotransmitters dopamine, norepinephrine, and serotonin. Tranquilizers and barbiturates mimic the effects of a neurotransmitter called gamma-aminobutyric acid, or GABA for short. Heroin, methadone, codeine, and other narcotics imitate the brain's own internal opiate-like neurotransmitters which regulate pain. And THC, the active compound in marijuana, mimics a recently discovered substance in the brain called anandamide, which is involved in regulating nausea and pain. It's really amazing how many ways there are to trick our brain into feeling good. Not only do different drugs work on different neurotransmitter systems, but the way they produce their false signals of pleasure also differs. For example, stimulants like cocaine and methamphetamine work by blocking an important process called reuptake. We've seen that when a neuron fires, it releases neurotransmitters into the synapse. These neurotransmitters bind to receptors on neighboring neurons and in doing so transmit important signals that tell the neurons to increase or decrease their activities. Once the message is delivered, the neurotransmitters are released from their receptors. These neurotransmitter molecules must now be quickly cleared out of the synapse or they will continue to bind to receptors over and over. This will disrupt the neuron's signaling process and prevent the brain from functioning normally. One of the ways the brain clears neurotransmitters from the synapse is through this process called reuptake. During reuptake, the neurotransmitter molecules get recycled and taken back up into the firing neuron where they can be made ready to be used again. Almost all stimulant drugs work primarily by blocking this reuptake process. Drugs such as cocaine very powerfully block the reuptake of dopamine as well as other neurotransmitters, including serotonin and norepinephrine. When the reuptake process is blocked, these neurotransmitters are forced to stay out in the synaptic cleft, where they then transmit their chemical signals over and over, making their messages much stronger than normal. For the receiving neuron, being bombarded by all of these extra messages is just like having the volume on a radio turn too high. As you can imagine, when these signals are coming from dopamine molecules in the reward pathways, the result of this bombardment is an instant and powerful feeling of pleasure. <laughs>
Unfortunately, however, when these signals are coming from other neurotransmitter pathways, such as norepinephrine pathways that control heart rate and blood pressure, the results can be tragic. In fact, this over-amplification of neurotransmitter signals is the main reason behind the flooding of emergency rooms in the 1980s and 90s with cases of stimulant-related seizures and heart attacks. So while stimulants alter the effects of neurotransmitters by blocking reuptake, tranquilizers and barbiturates affect neurotransmitter function in another way. Tranquilizers and barbiturates, along with alcohol, are most of the drugs in a class broadly called depressants. These substances produce their depressant effects on the brain by mimicking the effects of the neurotransmitter GABA. In another series of programs, we've shown how alcohol affects GABA ion channels by causing these channels to leak excess negative ions into the neuron, causing it to fire less frequently. Tranquilizers and barbiturates also cause more negative ions to flow through GABA channels, but do so in a different way. These drugs bind to receptor sites on the GABA channel just like the real GABA neurotransmitter molecules. By doing so, they cause the GABA channels to open more often and for longer periods of time, with the result being more negative ions entering the neuron and less brain activity. Just like depressant drugs, opiate drugs like heroin, morphine, codeine, and Vicodin also bind to receptor sites and mimic the effects of neurotransmitters. However, opiates bind specifically to brain receptors that control our ability to experience pain and pleasure. In so doing, these drugs directly block the perception of pain and enhance the perception of pleasure. So, as you can see, each of these classes of drugs has their own specific way of interacting with neurons and, as a result, has its own set of behavioral effects. But one effect that all abused drugs have in common is their ability to directly or indirectly stimulate the reward pathways. Nearly all of our pleasurable experiences, from the thrill of victory to the taste of home cooking to sex, are caused by neurons firing in the reward pathways. These neurons are linked with areas of the brain controlling emotions, decision-making, and memory. To communicate with one another, neurons in the reward pathways use the powerful neurotransmitter dopamine. When neurons fire and release dopamine in the reward pathways, it results in feelings of euphoria and pleasure. When substances such as alcohol, nicotine, cocaine, Valium, heroin, or any of the other drugs which have abuse potential enter the brain, they cause neurons in the reward pathways to release dopamine. Dopamine then sends a message of well-being and euphoria along the pathway. Some drugs can stimulate the reward pathways directly, while others do so indirectly. In general, the more a drug affects the reward pathways directly, the more powerful that drug is as a reinforcer, and the more addictive it becomes. Drugs like cocaine, amphetamine, and similar substances work directly to enhance the effects of dopamine in the reward pathways. As a result, these drugs are powerful substances which can create rapid and intense feelings of pleasure. The effects of opiate drugs like heroin, morphine, and codeine on the function of endogenous opiate neurotransmitters indirectly causes the release of more dopamine within the reward pathways of the brain. That is how these drugs are able to both reduce our perception of pain and produce their rewarding or pleasurable effects. Tranquilizers and barbiturates also affect the reward pathways indirectly by mimicking the effects of the neurotransmitter GABA. As an inhibitory neurotransmitter, GABA opens ion channels that allow negative ions into the neuron, making it less likely to fire, inhibiting not only the brain's ability to process information, but also our ability to function normally. When you see the effect of barbiturate and tranquilizer drugs on GABA channels, it's easy to understand the connection between neurons transmitting fewer messages and a brain that's slow and out of sync. But what's not as obvious is how GABA influences the initial high we feel when we first take these drugs. So how does GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter, cause dopamine to be released? As we already know, 
GABA channels disrupted by barbiturates or tranquilizers inhibit neurons from firing. Some of these neurons normally send their inhibitory messages to dopamine neurons. But when these drugs are present, the dopamine neurons start to receive fewer inhibitory messages. Eventually, these don't fire messages stop coming. And in the absence of any messages telling them not to, the dopamine neurons release their dopamine more often, resulting in greater feelings of pleasure. Glutamate is an important excitatory neurotransmitter. Like GABA, glutamate controls ion channels in the membrane bilayer. But whereas GABA controls the flow of negatively charged ions into the neuron, glutamate controls the flow of positively charged ions. This influx of positively charged ions excites the neuron, making it more likely to fire. The disruption of glutamate channels by drugs like PCP, often called angel dust, or ketamine, causes memory problems and impaired decision-making. So, cocaine, amphetamine, and other related stimulants affect the reward pathways directly, while other drugs, including opiates, barbiturates, tranquilizers, marijuana, and PCP, stimulate the reward pathways indirectly. But whether the effect is direct or indirect, all of these drugs are very effective at sending their false messages of pleasure. To understand the full impact of drug abuse on the brain, it is critical to understand that all drugs of abuse produce not only pleasurable effects by acting on the reward pathways, but many other effects as well. As we've just learned, Drugs produce all of their effects by interfering with the normal actions of the brain's neurotransmitters. When drugs interfere with neurotransmitters, it changes the chemistry of brain areas such as the reward pathways, the hippocampus, the cerebellum, and the cerebral cortex. These brain areas control a wide range of feelings and behaviors, including pleasure, memory, balance, coordination, and decision-making. We've also learned that drugs have several effects. These effects are caused by changing the functioning of neurotransmitters, receptors, ion channels, and reuptake sites at the synapses of neurons. We know that people take drugs because it makes them feel good, not for their negative effects such as memory loss and impaired coordination. But recognizing the fact that we can't have one without the other, we begin to see the true power of drugs, substances so rewarding that they're in constant demand despite their negative consequences.